I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm glad you all braved the winter weather and made it here safe and sound. Snow is a big deal in our house. It's a big deal. Yesterday morning, I believe my guys were up around 5.30 in the morning looking for snow pants and gloves, and then they were out the door by 6.30 in the morning before the sun was up. They would have gotten out there quicker, but, you know, it takes 30 minutes to put all that gear on, right? But good old snow days. And on a Saturday at that, you could almost hear the wailing teachers all around Knoxville. <laughs> why, oh why, on a Saturday? <laughs> but it got me thinking about how we all experience things so differently. For me, with three little boys, yesterday was full of going out in the cold, coming in, going out in the cold, coming in, going out in the cold. <laughs> Teachers crying to themselves about a wasted day of snow. Or for someone like my neighbor who doesn't have children, well, she just stayed inside the entire day. I'm guessing she was just enjoying the beauty of the snow and the warmth. And so I've been thinking about baptism all week because we just heard Josh about the gospel, about Jesus being baptized, and something hasn't left me. Baptism means all kinds of things to all kinds of people. There's not just one meaning. For some, it's about joining the church. For some, it's about being adopted by God. For some, it's about having sins forgiven. For some, it is a tradition that their family has done for years. The baptismal gown being passed down from one generation to the other, right? And then for others, it's a choice made after a lifetime of soul searching. All of these different meetings rolled into one ritual act that Christians have been doing for over 2,000 years. But it all began with this. It all began with this. This one event of Jesus being baptized by John in the Jordan. All four Gospels tell about this. It's important. <laughs> See, Jesus' baptism tells about our own baptism. All of those meanings that we attach to baptism, they're all good and well. But I think at the heart of baptism, it's the declaration of identity. The declaration of identity. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Identity. It's about who we truly are. Who we truly are. And what baptism tells us is that our primary identity is a child of God. We're children of God. Now, don't let that just be one of those Christian phrases you hear and dismiss. <laughs> let it resonate. We are children of God. And how we identify ourselves, it's very important. When I was in high school, my family vacationed a lot in Charleston, South Carolina. So on one summer, I liked Charleston so much, we were downtown, I visited the College of Charleston, and I said, that's where I'm going to go to school. College of Charleston. We call it the College of Knowledge. The College of Knowledge. A fine southern school where I learned the proper, proper title of the Civil War is the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> it's located in the heart of downtown Charleston. Perhaps one of the biggest academic draws to me was it was 15 minutes from the beach. <laughs> I was a very serious student. Anyway, I attended my first two years at old CFC and loved it. I made good grades, met great people, enjoyed Charleston immensely. Now, my freshman year, I lived in a dorm. That's what everybody did, right? And there's one word to describe that, gross. <laughs> so I moved into an apartment for my sophomore year with six other guys. Six other guys, one apartment. Again, gross. <laughs> but it was during my sophomore year that I met a friend who had changed my life, Michael. Now, Michael had attended the College of Charleston, but was not currently enrolled. But he knew everyone, went to the same parties, hung out with the same crowd I did. So we got to know each other. We connected. He had a very interesting past. He grew up going to boarding schools. He'd gotten cancer when he was young, but he was a survivor. He was a musician that had actually sold a song to a movie. I mean, he was older than me by a couple of years, but man, we became friends. Really interesting guy. Well, by the end of my sophomore year, I decided I wanted to spend the summer in Charleston instead of going back to Chattanooga. So I got a job selling t-shirts, got a job making some money living in this apartment with Michael, my new roommate, my friend. 
And I got to know him really well, or so I thought. <laughs> One day at the end of our summer break, I got a letter from a company saying that I had ordered a word processor and I hadn't paid the bill. Well, I never ordered that, and I didn't know what they were talking about. Come to find out, my roommate had ordered this word processor. And when I confronted him, it did not go well. And so it kind of made me curious about some other things he had told me. I found an old roommate of his, and some things that he had told me just didn't add up. Michael was not who he said he was. He didn't go to the boarding school he had said he went to. He had never had cancer, and he had never written that song in the movie. Soon I realized I didn't know this guy at all. His last name wasn't even really his last name. You get that? <laughs> I mean, who was this guy? Well, it totally freaked me out, because I'd seen enough horror movies <laughs> to know what was going to happen. <laughs> so I got out of there. <laughs> I called my parents, and they came and got me that weekend, moved back home to Chattanooga. I never went back to C of C. Michael, I told you, he changed my life. When I think of someone who doesn't know who they are, I think of my old friend Michael. And I've seen the craziness that comes from not knowing who you are. And don't miss it. His not knowing who he was directly affected me. It affected me deeply. So here's what I realize now, though. I know the church isn't perfect, but I'll tell you this. The church told me who I was. The church told me who I was, who I am. I knew that God loved me, and that's made all the difference in the world. Even then, back in college when I was finding myself, at the core, I knew God loved me. And now please, hear me clearly. This is not to say I was better than my friend in any way. In fact, of a lot of ways, Michael was actually a lot kinder than I was. But deep down, I had been given something, an identity that has carried me through all kinds of things in my life, including the betrayal of a friend. We have been given an identity in baptism. We are God's beloved. And because of how I see myself, I am able to see Michael as a beloved child of God too. That's why knowing that we are beloved children of God, children of God, that phrase matters. It matters so much. It's foundational to who we are. And it affects everything, all of our relationships. I mean, sure, the ritual of the sacrament of baptism is just a one-time event, but baptism is actually a lifetime event. <laughs> it is a lifetime event, something we live into as we are constantly responding to God's love. Just listen to our baptismal questions. They're all looking toward the future. Listen to these. These are not light questions. <laughs> Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Will you continue? Will you persevere? Will you proclaim? Will you seek? Will you serve? Will you strive? These are not questions that imply baptism is just a one-time event and you're done. These are forward-looking questions. These questions are constantly to be answered by us for the rest of our lives. They tell us who we are. They tell us who we are. And it begins with our true identity. You are a beloved child of God. And you are a beloved child of God. And you are a beloved... We are all beloved children of God. So with that in mind, please stand. That's right. I'm going to ask you to stand. Get your prayer books out, the red books. Turn to page 304. 304. 
We are going to recommit ourselves for the new year. This is who we are. This is who we are. We are God's beloved. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Son of the Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and the born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will, will God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, will God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will, will God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, will God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, God's help. Amen.